I've got a lot of stuff here for mailbag today. I've actually got about 30 packages. I'm going to be recording about three weeks worth of mailbag in one go. It's going to be a busy day. So let's get stuck into this one. Don't forget to check out the links down below for various items of showing the mailbags. If you're interested in anything, go and take a look. Right, these are some mounts. The reason I actually got this is because I've got a dash cam with one of my cars, well, all my vehicles got dash cams in. The ball joint mount on it failed. Basically, a suction cup deteriorated from the UV because New Zealand's got a lot of UV light here. The sun's quite powerful and strong here, so it tends to destroy things quite quickly with UV. Anyway, the suction cup basically failed. It just wouldn't hold a suction anymore. It basically split across the center here. I had to sort of cobble together something to keep the dash cam in operation. I think that was all the same. This one's got a different mount on it too. It came with. I'm not sure I'm going to be using that mount, but I think this was a different size. I don't know, it looks the same. <laughs> this one came with this mount as well. I'm quite sure what came with that one. Yeah, because I needed this ball joint mount, because this is what fits on my dash cam. A lot of times things will have like this threaded coupler. This is another mount which I've got laying around, which I was going to butcher up to make it work. And yeah, well, I did actually end up butchering one, but I managed to not need to use this one. I've got to put this one back away in my junk bin. But a lot of them have got these like quarter inch threaded fittings on them. What size are those? I can't remember. About 16, 17 mil maybe. 17 mil about there. Yeah, call it 17 mil. It's the same. Yeah, 17. And the same again. Yeah, about 17. It's all about 17 mil these ones. Now I think my dash cam actually had a 16 mil ball on it, so I'm hoping I can actually use these and just make them fit. I'm hoping. Now the reason I actually got three of them is because well, I need one right now. I also have a identical dash cam in another vehicle, which is exactly the same situation, and it's about the same age, so I'm thinking that's going to fail soon as well. I expect so I've got a spare one for that, and that'll leave me one for the future. I should be set for the next five years. I think these are probably at last dash cams actually. Thanks a lot to my Patreon supporters and my YouTube members to help support the channel. Because those people would allow me to buy more things from our bag and to buy things to repair for my repair videos. Those little projects I do. Oh, I'll drop some chip on the floor. Don't need that one. Also, if it's your first time here, don't forget to click subscribe. So, these are 74LS193N. Or are they? Not found. Hmm. Okay. You see, we're not in here. Or it's not real. I've got some more 193s here. Let's have a look at one of these, see if these pass the test. So this one's ones I've already got. No, I can't find them either. So, okay. They may be real. Who knows? I need a bit of tester. Oh, wait, I probably actually have one. Hmm. So I've got my Retro Chip Tester Pro here, which does lots and lots of chips. There we go, 74193. Well, that's an LS, which is not quite the same, but it's similar. Let's try it. Oh, I should put the chip in there first. Okay. It's okay, it's a real chip. So this thing here is a kit you can buy. You can have to assemble it yourself. I highly recommend getting one because you always need testers. As you saw, I had that little IC tester. Didn't detect the chip. This one can do it. So this is a great example of why you need multiple testers because sometimes your tester won't support that particular device. Another one will. Now this you can buy. So the guy just sells it as a basically a bare board with a programmed IC if you choose to have it programmed by him. You have to build it yourself and buy all the parts yourself and stuff like that, but I do have like a parts list you can get anyway, but I've done this in a previous video, so yeah, but handy thing to have. Alright, next package. It's a couple of capacitors. 25 volt, 25 microfarad. I seem to keep getting these in drips and drabs. Like, I get a couple here, the couple there, and all just keep turning up really slowly. I think I must have ordered a bunch of them at one point, and as they gradually get in stock, they're gradually sending me a couple. I think it's like four or five different times now. I've had two in a bag by themselves, like that. Um, yeah, just capacitors. Someone will be pleased anyway. Some people really like it when I get capacitors in my bag. 
don't you? You know who you are. So I was recording this video on this particular item in mailbag, which I opened up and everything on camera. Because my camera runs off a mains powered system, it lost the footage. Good job I do it in chunks, isn't it? Anyway, pull down fuses, that's what's in here. Okay, so I actually got these from out of home. And I did a big explanation about how it works and everything. It's really interesting. You should have been there. So this is now the third time I've tried to record this because we keep getting some power outages. <laughs> Any time it does it, I lose the footage. So these are 40 amp fuses which are for my motor home. And what I've actually got in there, I've got a big chunking relay in there. It's a massive high current relay. And it's got two states. In one state, it's charging my vehicle battery from my house system. Actually, I should explain this in more detail. So in the motor home, I've got two systems right so you have always have your vehicle battery which is basically runs your engine your vehicle stuff right your standard engine battery stuff then you have your house battery which is what runs all the accessories and what have you in the motorhome part like your inverter and what have you what i've got in mind is i've got this big relay in there which links the two together in two different states in one state when the vehicle was basically parked the engine's off i've got a trickle charge circuit which runs from the house battery system to the vehicle battery it goes, I've got a big 5 amp shocky diode in there and a resistor so it limits the current that can possibly trickle charge through so I can't do too much. I think I can do like an amp or so, be fairly easy. I've done it to limit it so you can't do too much and it's just, it's just yeah, the trickle charge, the main battery, the main battery is always kept at a decent state so if the thing's part up for three months, which happens from time to time, then it will just sit there charging it up, keep the battery in a good state and that was fine. In the other state I have a basically a link between the vehicle battery and the motorhome battery in a basically a direct connection. On the vehicle battery end, I've got a thermal cutout, so it's basically rated at 40 amps, and when it reaches sort of 40 amps or so, it's got like a biometrical strip in it, and it'll just disconnect. It's an overload thing, and that's there to protect it all. That's from the vehicle battery end of it, and on the house battery end of it, I have a fuse block, and I just have a 40 amp fuse in that block. So if you have a large current, a brief period, but high current, you can actually blow this fuse before it activates the thermal overload because obviously a thermal overload takes a little bit of a time to work. I've blown a couple of these fuses, I've had some issues with the system and I'll actually talk about it more in another video I expect but it works basically but under certain circumstances it goes horribly wrong and it blows the fuse. So <laughs> I've had those circumstances a couple of times and I only bought like a two pack of fuses at a time from a local distributor and they're really expensive. That's why these, so I've got a connection there from a lifetime supply of 40 amp fuses but I'm also going to modify the system a little bit because right now there's basically no current limiting on it apart from the fuses. So what I've actually purchased as well, which I don't know if it's in this mailbag or not, maybe in my future mailbag, I don't know, it may not even be here yet, is basically a big high wattage resistor. And I'm going to put that in series with that circuit in order to limit current. So the idea is that right now, I'll say it's going battery to battery through the thermal overload and the fuse. So if the alternator is running charging the batteries up, then it should be charging up the house battery at the same time. And that's why I've got that link in there. So when the engine's running, it's charging up the house battery if it needs it, right? So sometimes I'll actually need to do that when you've got like bad weather or middle of winter or something like that. It's been very overcast and very cloudy. And I've had no real charging power from the solar system. I've got like 700 or 800 watts of solar power on the roof of the motorhome. So it can do quite a bit. But in winter, it can be a problem. And we do use a lot of power when we're doing events. So it can be, there. basically as a backup system. We don't plug in at all. We just use purely solar. When those two batteries are linked together through that relay, it's relying on no, not trying to draw too much current from that system whilst it's charging and these fuses to protect it. And so what you want to do is put in a big resistor in there. I'm going to modify that because right now it's just got a link across the relay. So it just links the two batteries together. I'm going to take that link out and put a, re a big resistor in there instead. So that will limit the current a little bit and give it a bit of a buffer, which should at least stop blowing fuses when it's getting a really heavy load on it. It should give it a bit of a buffer then reduce that stress. I think it's too much of a system right now, it's linking them directly together. So um, yeah, anyway, that's that. Fuses. And a lot of waffling. Rubber mounts, fans, cooling fan mounts. I think they're all the same size. Fair to be. So sometimes on a fan you want to reduce the noise it produces and you want to take away some kind of resonance from the chassis and that sort of stuff. So these are some rubber mounts, so you can just basically sandwich this with the fan, maybe some rubber grommets, 
You've got some rubber ones you can pull through as well. I've got some of those. And it's basically for completely rubber mount the fan, which helps to reduce a lot of the noise resonated into the chassis, which keeps the thing a lot quieter. So I've got some of these. I think these are 120 mil, but they also have potential second use, which is why I got them. On my Valhalla 2500 EP, the fan that's mounted on there is a plastic fan, which is fine. But it's a 115 volt plastic fan, and it's also very noisy, and it's basically worn out because it's fairly old and it's had a lot of use, I think. So I want to replace that fan, but a lot of fans you get are metal case fans, like the frame is made out of metal, not plastic. And it has to be made out of plastic, and it has to be insulated, because the fan attaches to the two heat sinks inside it, and the heat sinks are different potentials because they're attached to some TO3 transistors. They have to be isolated from each other, you can't short them together. So if you had a metal case fan, you couldn't do that. Anyway, so these are some mounting plates which I thought I might need to use to provide insulation. If I can't find a plastic fan, and I can only get metal ones, I need to insulate it somehow. So I thought if I got these rubber mats, I could use that to isolate the frame from the actual heat sinks. And then I've got to use plastic screws to screw it to the heat sinks itself. That way it would be completely isolated from it and it wouldn't be any conduction. That's my workaround if I can't find a decent plastic fan. So that's what I've got those for. Someone commented about my RAM knife again. Yes, it's a RAM knife. Yes, it's not a real knife. Yes, a real knife would cut better. No, I'm not going to use a real knife. I use a RAM knife because it doesn't damage things inside the packages. And no, I'm not going to change. <laughs> Really? Mm, okay. It's just a plug. New Zealand crappy plug. New Zealand plugs are rubbish. I've had a big rant about this in the live stream once about how rubbish New Zealand plugs are. Here's another New Zealand plug which is rubbish. But I needed a plug and you got very few choices. They're all crap. Okay. What's in here? Okay. This is a review item. This has taken quite a while to get to me because of issues with shipping. Finally managed it. Excellent. This is the Shannon tweezer. SMD tweezer. So this is for doing SMD component testing. This is a DIY project, I suppose. You may even have it on Kickstarter. I'm not sure, but there's definitely a thread on the EV book forum about these. I actually read it for a little while. I should go back and refresh memory. And he's been trying to send this to me for ages because he's having issues with shipping and the kit's on getting sent back because it's got a tiny little lithium cell inside it. And um, it's causing no end of problems trying to get it sent to me. I don't know why. Other places we're able to receive it just fine. It seems New Zealand's been a bit funny about it. Anyway, so this is like a little test board he's got with it as well for testing individual components to demonstrate it. Excellent. So I'll be doing a proper review on this thing. It comes with a cable as well, a little USB charging cable there, USB C. So I need to charge this up. Yeah, I'll do a proper review on this. That should be very interesting. Very nice. It's got a little menu on it, and menu system, and just different components on it. The menu structure, so you can do resistance, capacitance, inductance, auto ranging, diodes, LED, frequency testing, 10 kilohertz down to 100 hertz, voltage level settings, okay, calibration options. Nice. So I've been doing a full review on this, so make sure you subscribe to check that out. Um, these look like a nice little device, and also it's sent through a little pouched for it to go in as well, a little storage pouch. Cool. I can fit that in there too. Probably not. I think it's asking too much of the foam. <laughs> but, uh, cool. Excellent. Thank you very much Shannon for sending that through to me. And uh, so, like I said, subscribe and I'll be doing a review on these things. In the not too distant future. Because I've got so far ahead with mailbags right now, so it's ridiculous. And so I'm not quite sure whether the review will come out before this mailbag or the other way around. When you watch this video and you see the tweezers on here, go and check my reviews playlist and see if I've already done a review on these. I maybe have, maybe haven't. 
I try and get the timing right so it is one after the other, but there's no guarantees these days. Everything's a bit chaotic. And the last thing for today, let's see what this is. Well, it's in China because it's got some Chinese newspaper. Only on the top though. <laughs> Why don't people wrap things properly? I mean, wrap it in a, you know, anyway. Maybe it's stop rattling around the box, but the amount of times I've seen stuff with just stuff on the top of the box and nothing on the bottom to protect it, and the bottom's the one that gets dropped. So, this cart is training. Here's a clue 65 Magic Eye Tube. Now, this is for this thing over here. This needs a new magic eye tube because it's really faded and dim. So I'm hoping that I can put this one in. If this works all right, I might actually buy another one. I don't have any spares. I like to have spares of everything. Always have spares of everything. Get them while you can. I might turn this on there actually just show you how dim this tube is and I'll swap it out with this one and we'll check it again. Well, I've had it on for a little bit now. It's now warmed up. I can just see it glowing. You can just see the green there. See how dim that is? With the lights on, you can't, almost can't see it at all. I've got to set the bridge mode right now, so it should be just showing full green, but yeah, it's just really bad. Let me swap this tube out. Right, let's turn it back on. New tube is installed. You see if it's much brighter. It will take a minute to warm up. Here we go. Oh, look at that. That's much better. That's a huge difference. That's how it's supposed to be. Excellent. If I change it to discharge, there's magic eye. So I've got to rotate it a little bit. I've got to rotate it around. Get these two lines here to be horizontal. That way that will sit at the bottom. That'd be right then. But that's good. It works. Excellent. Happy with that. I'm going to buy some more then. That now means I can finish doing this repair video, which I've been waiting to do. I was waiting for a tube. So this is the original one. It's an RCA branded one. Yeah. Oh well. Time to get some more. Excellent. Don't forget to click like and subscribe if you're not been here before and I'll catch you next video. Check out the playlist at the end. Bye.